Come get your victory. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on whatever time you have decided to tune in with us. We would like to welcome you to another episode of Victory at the Table Talk, where we have down-to-earth conversations about various topics to assist with your walk with Christ. Here at the table, you can get the victory, but you can also get a taste of Victory Apostolic Church right here in Matson, Illinois, where we are building victorious Christ-like lives. Enjoy this episode. Praise the Lord and welcome to another episode of Victory at the Table Talk. I am Pastor Drew. I'm your director of your youth ministries and our virtual slash online ministries. And I'm excited to be hosting another episode of our Senior Pastors Raw Leadership Principle Series, which stands for Real Authentic Words. Last week, Last week, we covered the call, the three C's of leadership. We started with the call. And today, I'm excited because we are going to be covering conduct. And this is something that everybody needs to tune in with that we all could do just a little bit better about. And since, since we just ended Valentine's Day, we don't get to, to share our love in front of everybody often. So I want to say, I love you, Dad. Well, thank you, son. I, lo- I love you too. You're not my Valentine. I'm but not. I, no, anyway. No, nope. That ain't that kind of party here. But, <laughs> but he's still my father. I, as I told you guys on the last episode, I've been getting these nuggets that he gives all the time, and that's why I thought it would be good to share him, as I've been sharing him with our church for about 25 years now. Anyway, so as I said, today's episode is on conduct. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Pastor Singleton of Victory Apostolic Church. Praise the Lord, everyone. I am so glad to address you again. And let me tell you, <laughs> Old School is Learning podcast. I was amazed at how many of you watched our first one and how you were sharing it with others and how we're especially able to help leaders who we normally meet with during our Victory Association times. And you'll hear more about that at another time. We're able to get out information that helps pastors develop their leaders and help pastors continue to grow. And so, yes, last time we talked about what the call to ministry and service, whether a pastor, whether a men, women, youth leader, whatever was all about. And today, the the material is so rich, it's going to take at least three classes. You heard me. Three classes to deal with the second C of conduct or character. Pretty much same thing. And today I wanted to lay the foundation of good character. Now, without really trying to say a whole lot, most of us know what bad character to look at if we look at our ex-president. Oh, I can't say that. Tech, 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 tech. tech, tech. All right, so I won't say no more. (laughs) I don't want to get in no trouble. You know, you got 75 million followers, so I'll just leave that alone. He used to. I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone. He's been muted from that social media, so I don't know if he has so many followers anymore. Oh, that's true. (laughs) That's true. He may not have so many. But we do know they include the Proud Boys, so I ain't. I'm, let's leave it alone. Amen, amen. So, so, so yes. as you said, everybody knows what bad character is. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out how you define bad character. How would you define what good character is? Good character is that which refers to moral qualities of people who live by high ethical standards and live by high principles. Uh, let me give you an example. People of character, they do what's right irrespective of how they feel about it. Message. Or even if it's going to hurt them by being that person of good character. So to me, good characters is, 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 is really something that is really something we have to get more and more into the body of Jesus Christ. So are you are you just saying that good character is only required from those in leadership, or is this something that it, it kind of fits within the, the realm of everybody should be doing? Thanks for asking that. 
first and most important, good character is required of all Christians. That's it. Because he's called all Christians out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And we must understand that uh, character is generally formed by the age of 13. Any psychologist or psychiatrist will tell you that. So we must understand that when a person has been born again and they become, as the Bible says, a new creation right. in Christ Jesus, that person experiences a reformed character as they submit to the Holy Spirit that now lives in them who wasn't in them before. So again, the Bible in the New Testament approaches character from for all Christians. All of us are supposed to walk a life that shows a life of Christ likeness in their lives. Amen. So what you're saying is the same standards. And since we're talking about church, the same standards that the members have of their leaders, shouldn't they be following those standards also? That is correct. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Awesome. There's no question about it. It's, 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 it's not so much a different set of standards that we'll talk more about later for leaders is that leaders are, are held to a higher standard of doing them. Message. Okay. That I got you. So, so you're saying that leader standard is higher. Why do you think that the leader has the higher standard? Whether and let's, and let's try to go off of the church and just leadership in general. So since you brought up Trump earlier, why do you feel that people that are in higher positions of leadership <laughs> should have more expected out of them as far as character and conduct. Very simple. People follow leaders. Hmm. Okay. So see, as a Christian, you can make decisions that only impact your life. But as a leader, by very definition, your life impacts other people. I don't care if you're a Sunday school teacher. I don't care if you're in the men's ministry, women, whatever. Matter of fact, there's a saying going like this, because a lot of people think they lead us once they get a title. But that's not true. You can be Reverend Dr. Archbishop this or that. <laughs> but when you look at this one trait, this is how you'll know, irrespective of a title, if that person is a leader, who's following them. Someone put it this way. If a person says they are a leader and no one's following them, they they're out for a walk. <laughs> Taking a stroll. Amen. So now that we figured out good character, why leaders should be held accountable, just a little bit higher than the typical person, let's start diving into what makes character. We're starting with pretty much integrity. So mm -hmm. how I've always viewed mm -hmm. integrity is being able to do the right thing all the time, even if no one is watching. Is that something that, that is the definition of it? Okay. That is the definition. Uh, and since this is free flow, I want to say a little bit more before we get into this. I'll come right back to it. Not only as we're dealing with leaders from the aspect of, of people following, we have to remember the book of James says, don't many of you be leaders because you're going to receive the greater judgment. Leaders receive a greater judgment mm. because again, in the, if, if, if the, if you follow someone in who is falling into a ditch, then the people fall in also. So leaders receive ultimately more judgment. And that's why it's not something you should go after if you don't really feel a strong call to leadership because even then the enemy attacks the leader's life more, far more, than he attacks the average Christian's life. This is the reason that you will see, and I'm not naming anybody, but all of you who are watching know you see so many mega church pastors falling. Some fall that we can talk about later because I think they get into these roles too young. Message. Others fall because they have not developed the character necessary uh. to withstand the attacks and onslaughts of the enemy, which is beyond their comprehension. And then they end up falling. But God holds us as leaders more accountable. And so leaders have to be in, used to being in right relationship and right fellowship with Jesus Christ, no matter what the cost. Now, getting back to this whole sense on qualities 
There are many qualities of, of character that we cannot cover. Uh, for instance, good leaders with good character, they are compassionate, they are optimistic, they are reliable, uh, they are forgiving. But today, as, as, as Pastor Drew was saying, I, I do. I want to focus more on, on some really key ones. And the first, you nailed it, the first is integrity. But what do we mean when we say integrity? I want you to note the first few letters of it, I-N-T-E. And you can even add the G, which ties into another word called integer. Lesson time, come on. An integer is a whole number. A big part of integrity is wholeness. Message. A person who has integrity is a whole complete person. That is a person who is consistent in their day to day walk. That's the word. That is a person who is authentic in their day to day walk. People in general, do not trust a person who lacks integrity. Amen. Christian or not. Christian or not. Amen. Christian or not. It could be your job, school, neighbor. We, 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 don't, we don't trust people whose word we can't rely on and who speak one thing and do another. Uh, my son is young, so he doesn't know kind of the things I know about when I was coming up in my teenage and 20 years, the few times I did go to church. <laughs> It took the Holy Ghost to get me in church. Mm -mm. But having said that, in the denomination I was in then, I don't want to name the denomination, I'm going to get a lot of responses. But in that denomination, it was common among the preachers, Pastor Drew, they would say, do as I say not as I do. and not as I do. <laughs> Their lives were so jacked up. Everybody knew it, but they still wanted to get behind what my pastor called the sacred desk. Wow. And tell people how to live. And that's, and that's Proverbs does a lot of talk about integrity. Uh, 11 and 3 says the integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Awesome. And I, I just remember you said earlier that the why the leaders are held to such a higher standard is because they can destroy so many people that are following them. So no that, doubt that about just, it. That speaks volumes. That's good. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Uh, I, I feel that in integrity is something that you will not know you have until it's put to the test That's over it. and over again. Message. That's it right there. And this is, we're going to talk later about, I told you, I want you to stay excited. There are going to be other classes. I'm going to deal with people who have fallen in character and have rebounded. So I'm doing this to, to tease you to keep up with these uh, podcasts. Because that's the story of me and you. Talk more about it later. You, you know, even though you've been born again, filled with the spirit, called to leadership, there has been serious moral and ethical failure in your life. You need to know this. God ain't through with you yet. Amen. And Amen. The next one that I think is, is important is self-control, discipline. My pastor, Bishop Arthur Embrasier, used to often say, Elder Singleton, before long before I became a pastor, he said, it's discipline. And now, all these years later, I know, and my family knows, I am one of the most disciplined, methodical people you will ever see in your life. Amen. And I've reached a place in my life, it doesn't matter how I feel about it. I'm going to do what's right. And I always think about the, the definition of discipline that you gave me before I went to college. Uh, got put to the test a lot and failed a lot, but we're not talking about that today. But he defined discipline as doing what needs to be done when you don't feel like doing it. Well, let me and rephrase a little go bit. Ahead. Doing he, oh. what needs to be done whether you feel like it or not. Okay, so he gave it a little juice. He added some steroids since I went away to college. Say it again. What's the definition? For me, one of the definitions of self-discipline is doing what needs to be done, whether you feel like it or not. Damn See, it. think about your children. He's got, my son has a, a, a two-year-old, four-year-old, six-year-old, and little kids go through this when you tell them something. I don't feel like washing dishes. I don't feel like cleaning. See, when you become a leader, it ain't got nothing to do about what you feel like. Mm. 
It has to do with what is the right thing to do. That's it right there. That's good. And discipline, just, it just it isn't a one-time thing. It's, it's something that is a quality that is developed just over time of practicing discipline in all areas of that person's life. That you? is correct. Got you. Okay. That is correct. Because you see, the re- one of the reasons self-control is so critical, you must first lead yourself before you're qualified to lead others. <laughs> Message. See, a person who lacks self-discipline, self-control, and not even clear on themselves, they, they are always convoluted. They're always all over the place because they haven't learned how to lead themselves. Anyone who has not learned how to lead themselves is totally unqualified to lead others. Amen. Amen. And one of the things that I looked up with discipline, it says discipline is a cultivated series of characteristics and behaviors that promote a balanced life. Highly disciplined people aren't simply better at resisting their desires or getting more work done. So that means that they have just gained the skills just over time and it fits discipline all throughout their entire life. So this is where this is how they live their life, whether it's working out, whether it's getting up and going to work, whether it's raising their kids. You can't be disciplined in one area and totally throw that discipline away in another area. They all should be connected. Ouch, ouch. Double ouch. They should be connected. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Because how many times have you, and I'm not knocking you as pastor's minister, Pastor Drew said this. Sorry. But it's true. Because I deal with ministers who are disciplined about their study, disciplined about their morals, and they are totally unphysically fit. Mm. Weighing three, four hundred pounds, and in a work as a pastor here of a mega church with over 3,000 members doing work that is extremely stressful work. And then thinking because they're doing the work and they're disciplined in other areas that God lets them off the hook in that area. Wrong. Pastor Drew, you nailed it. It's about balance. Amen. I'm often asked, passing, how do you Deal with all of this stuff. Well, first of all, I do it because God has called me to do as I covered in the last class. But also, over the years, 18 years under the most tremendous leader and his others who helped me to grow, not just ministers but friends, these all played a role, including time of helping me develop whatever I am today. And the point I'm trying to drive home now is, With so many responsibilities, I have learned it is crucial that I am balanced. Well, Pastor, what involves balance for you? I know you want to ask that. I'm going to answer. First and foremost, that balance includes me staying right with God every single day. Message. My, My prayer life, my study life, my devotional life. Those are non-negotiables. The staff here knows before I come into the office for an eight-hour-plus day, I've already done two to three hours of prayer, study, sermon, prayer, Bible, before I even leave the house every day with the exception of maybe a Saturday. Amen. That sets the tone for the spiritual work. And I want y'all to hear this. I'm talking primarily about spiritual leadership. I hope you can apply this to your jobs and as a manager. There are principles here I'm sharing with you that I think are applicable. But make no mistake about it. My focus is spiritual. Well, Pastor Singleton, why is that so important? It's so important because you cannot be a spiritual leader and you lack spirituality. Mm. Say that one more time. You cannot be a spiritual leader and lack spirituality. This is why I get so upset when I'm out in the streets and stuff, and I hear about ministers and pastors who, who just have, who have vulgar mouths, and they think because they help the poor and they preach and teach that they're excluded, and they are bringing down the gospel every time they open up their mouth, or pastors or leaders who are immoral think nothing about it. No, it's wrong. Mm. And that and, oh. and that's why self control is kind of listed as is, is not kind of but it's listed as a fruit of the spirit because it is our job to control our desires and not have our desires control the everyday decisions that we make. Once our desires as Christian leaders, now we're on leadership, control us, 
we have become a tool of the enemy. Mm. Message. We are no longer a tool of God. Why? Because God is holy and righteous. We have become, and, and we have really be fulfilled the scripture that we are now walking around as wolves in sheep's clothing. Yep. And this is what I think about is I have to make moral and wow. ethical decisions since I've been 20, well, I was called to the ministry at 28. Since that age, as I've gone through the and then what's helped me so much, we started talking about it last time, having a mentor of, of like a Bishop Brazier, that did not make me feel like I could never be him. What it made it for me was it gave me a clear path to follow. It's about, it's about how you look at it. Because some of these other leaders, they, they, were not, they, they were living such hypocritical lives that I really was confused about what it means to really walk with God. Wow. And so if you want to lead others, God's going to take his time. And let me give you a biblical example. Think about Joseph. Man of integrity. But but Joseph was arrogant. Mm -hmm. At 17, this, 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 this boy got a dream that God gave him. God didn't tell him to go and tell his <laughs> brothers and sisters, his mom and daddy, oh, y'all going to be bowing down to me. <laughs> they didn't where where, where did he tell him that? <laughs> and he didn't even have enough understanding of human nature to understand the baby brother. Who wants to hear that from him? Amen. <laughs> but by the time God... Has his brothers turn on him by the time he is in slavery, by the time he goes to prison, by that time he's been, under, I use the term, under the dirt long enough that when God exalts him, it's no longer about him anymore. And his self-glory is about God raised him up to save an entire nation from famine. That's why God doesn't play about us developing these disciplines, developing self-control, watching what we do. And here's a huge one. I begin to wrap up. You may have other questions. I'll be glad to answer them. Mm -hmm. A key one for me is accountability. That's big. It's humongous. This is one of the reasons I really hate losing my past at Bishop Brazier because I always felt accountable to him. And I've not shared this publicly. Y'all hearing stuff that people here ain't never heard. One of the things that kept me straight and away from immorality and cheating and stealing, I was always terrified of, of having to deal with him. Like a four-year-old is terrified to deal with their daddy. <laughs> a 38-year-old is terrified <laughs> of dealing with their daddy. Well, hey, I, was, I was terrified. And I'm saying, like, if I deal with this sister, I got to deal with him. I'm just going to have to do without this sister. <laughs> Cause I'm, not, I'm not going up in there dealing with this brother because I have made myself accountable to him. When he passed, I didn't say, oh, I'm going to pass this large church. My mentor is gone. My father in the gospel is gone, but I still need to be accountable. So I turned uh, to Bishop Horace Smith, pastor of 38th Street. Within three months of Bishop's death, some of you from 38th Street are watching. You can ask him. I went to him and said, I want you to be my mentor. I'm making myself accountable to you. Now, here's why accountability is so critical to leaders. We are still sinners. That's right. See, that's why I get nervous about people so holy. <laughs> because they really think because they have the Holy Spirit, they can't do wrong. They're wrong. The sinful nature never leaves never us. Never leaves. Well, Pastor Singleton, that's, that's scary. It is. But what is hopeful is the fact neither does the Holy Spirit never leave us. Message. And the Holy Spirit is more powerful than your old sinful nature. And since some of y'all are writing some things down, the nature you feed it's the nature that will dominate your life. Mm. Message. If you feed the sin nature, it'll okay. dominate your life. If you feed the new nature through the Holy Spirit, it'll dominate your life. If you don't feed the new nature, if you don't feed it, the sin nature is in control. But when you refuse to feed the sin nature, it will starve to death. That's right. That's right. And, and what I've learned just from this year, um, 20, or excuse me, from this past year, 2020, as, as my father knows, my wife knows, was a rough year 
for me personally because I was dealing with some things of the past that I was trying to get through. And something that I learned dealing with accountability that I wish I learned so long ago that there's four easy steps to being accountable. The first one is, is you see, see it. So the it is, see the things that are causing you to live in a way that are shameful. Number two, you own it. Yes, I'm doing this. I need. To, I can't do this anymore. This is wrong. I don't care how I feel. Step three, you solve it. So however you solve that, whether you're getting counseling, whether you're getting closer to God, and then number four, you now do it. Once you put all of these principles in, see it, own it, and you solve it, now all that's left is to continue to do it, and he just gave us an easy way to do it. The more we feed our spirit, the less we have to worry about our sinful nature dominating our lives. Amen. That's the less we have to worry about it. And it keeps us accountable, not only to our spouses, to our kids, to our pastors, but most of all, it keeps us accountable to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This this has been great, Pastor. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? We've talked about integrity, uh, self-discipline, accountability. Anything else you want to add? We talked about save everything? authenticity. Uh, as well, we, we, we've covered the things I wanted to cover pretty much is the main things that really should be of character in a Christian's life. Because one of the studies and some of you need to read Barner Research and Pew Research. One of the things that are coming out constantly from the younger under 40 generation and surveys is that there is no statistical difference between the lifestyles of those who say they are saved and those who are not. It makes for the destruction of the gospel. And these, some of these people who are like that, they sing in our choirs, they're mm. up on Sundays, they're soloists, and no one dares confront them with their ungodly lives that is destroying the gospel. And in their mind, because there's so much preaching about health and wealth and prosperity and prophecy that no one dares to, as Paul says, to reprove and correct them. Amen. And a lot of pastors don't reprove and correct because these same people that are leading their choirs and, 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 and doing great ministry work, they're good for business. So they make the bad mistake to look at the business side of the church and get rid of the whole character piece that is huge when it comes to the body of Christ. And if people aren't seeing the Christians living any different than what they're living and they're unsaved, then what's the point of them getting saved if we don't even believe that we can live different? What's the point of them getting saved if we live the same way they live? You just gave the reason they don't come to church. That's the reason they don't come. True story as we end this. Uh, most people know I work out. I'll be 70 years old, and, and be, I'm not bragging. It's just a fact. I'm in better shape than most guys half my age. Discipline. It's facts. Discipline. My son been in the gym with him. He didn't see me bench press. Some of the members, I'm cut halfway. I'm old man cut at least. <laughs> he got that strong man strip. I'm strong. <laughs> and you know, but I understand that physical health is also a way in which I deal with my stressors. See, I talked about God. Thanks for bringing this back. I talked about God as far as balance. I know some of you are wondering, well, what else? Well, the second thing in my balance is an incredibly healthy relationship with my wife, Brenda Singleton, who this year will be married 47 years. We keep our marriage healthy. Issues and problems come to the table. We deal with them, and we keep moving forward. My kids are part of my balance, who I'm very proud of, doing all well. And I can't even explain to you my grandkids and just how they make me feel. And then working out. It's a lot of ways in which to get and which to achieve balance in your life. But once I was in the gym, and as I was working out, Finishing it, a bunch of teenagers came in to the locker room. And I mean, they was cussing like sailors. So one of them was a member here. Mm -mm. And he looked over and saw me, and he said to his friends, that's Pastor Singleton, you need to watch your mouth. His friends said, and I quote, you got a lot of nerve. Wow. And that ended that. And I was ashamed. Because sometimes I feel the past, I'm not even reaching the people because they don't get it. They leave out of here thinking like this is a game. This is about people's eternal souls. And when we live hypocritical lives, we have played a role in those souls going to hell, and we're going to have to give an account. 
Amen. But that's not all your fault. As the as the word says, you can lead a horse to water. I know. But you can't make them drink. And you can lead a person to Christ, but you can't make them live. And that's why I say is how you make the, how it makes me feel. I know I'm not. Oh, okay. I'm just, okay. I'm just making yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. Clear. Well, that's Amen. all I have to say. Because I'll be talking another half hour. And I'm going to understand these podcasts ain't supposed to go long like that. <laughs> well, if the content is good, they could go long. But as you guys can see. Conduct is something that we're going to have to discuss longer than just this one episode. So we appreciate you all tuning in with us, and we pray that you guys had a awesome Valentine's Day. I know I enjoyed my wife and kids, and I know Pastor enjoyed his wife this past Sunday on Valentine's Day. But we do want to offer you guys to go to our website to find out about any other information. You could go to victoryapostolicchurch.org, and you can find out what's going on here at victory and for those of you that missed our last episode and some of our podcasts that are that we posted you can go to our youtube channel at victory apostolic church matteson so we appreciate you guys being with us we look forward to you being with us another day and you guys have a blessed rest of your week and thanks for joining us for this victory at the table talk we love you guys take care god bless everyone come get your victory at the table Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. Come get your victory.